Boom! Lust. It's the thing that no one wants to talk about. It's the elephant in the room, but a lot of people struggle with. I can't tell you how many conversations I've had with people that struggle with lust. When we say the word lust, not positive words come to mind, but negative words, negative things. And really, the first thing that comes to mind is sexual lust. The word lust is throughout the scriptures. We see it in the Old Testament and we see it in the New Testament as well. It's something that is not uncommon to man. In fact, it's what all people deal with at some point in their lives, whether it's sexual lust or lust for things or lust for somebody else's job or somebody else's possessions. There's this concept and idea that humans deal with often, and that is lust. Now, usually it's sexual lust that we talk about when we deal with lust because it seems to be what is most common for people to deal with and to struggle with. But the Bible shows us how lust actually works because if we're going to ever overcome lust, we have to figure out how it first works. And the Bible is very clear. Now, here's what the Bible says though. In 1 John chapter 2, beginning in verse 16, it says, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. So now we're dealing with these criteria of lust, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Now this should sound somewhat familiar to you as far as these temptations are concerned, not just because they're things that happen with the normal human being, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and pride of life, but if you go all the way back to the Garden of Eden, you will find that that's the very thing that led to the first sin, where mankind ate from the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. See, when we go back to the Garden of Eden, we see that there is a specific commandment by God where he says, look, you can have all of this luscious trees, you can have all the fruit from the trees, you can eat everything, but there's one tree, the fruit of which you cannot take, because in the day you take it, you shall surely die. Now, this was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If we're really to break that down a bit and we look into this concept of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil versus this other opposing tree that's called the tree of life, which we all wish that that's what they ate, well, we see that there's something going on that's beyond just the natural tree. So we have this tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and on this tree there's fruit. Now, the fruit is something that is forbidden for mankind to consume. And of course, there's spiritual undertones all throughout this story. But here's what the Bible says in Genesis chapter 3, verse 6. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eyes, and that it was desirable for obtaining wisdom, she took the fruit and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Notice the first thing is the lust of the flesh because it says she saw that the tree was good for food, for the flesh. Secondly, she sees that it's pleasing to the eyes, lust of the eyes. And thirdly, it was desirable for obtaining wisdom, the pride of life, how wise I shall be. 
And so the reality is John in 1 John is just talking about what has already been since the beginning, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. These are the areas and the criteria of which we have to deal and fight against lust. The book of James chapter 1 and verse 14 and verse 15, it says this, But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. So now we see the process of lust. Lust has to do with our own desires. We have this lust and these enticements that come and bring us to this place where we really long for something. And lust though takes it to another level where we are infatuated by something. We have to have it and it often leads to coveting. And I think the words can be used somewhat interchangeably when we consider these things. It's lust and it's coveting. It's these things that go together because you lust, you want something, you covet, you need something. I've got to have it. And so it says temptation that you deal with. It's when you're drawn away by your own lust. You're enticed therewith and you're pulled into a direction. And that's how lust works. You know when lust is in your life when you feel yourself being pulled into a given direction. That is lust. So we can stop at lust and, and say, I'm not going to submit to lust. I'm not going to go with that infatuation. I'm going to stop it here. I'm not gonna act upon it. But there's another degree where it says, when lust has conceived, it brings forth sin. And so if you mess around with lust for too long, it will eventually conceive and bring forth sin. So we have to stop lust before it has us and has the better hand. In 2 Samuel 13, we have this very vivid picture of how lust works. And it's with one of King David's sons. His son's name is Amnon, and he has another daughter whose name is Tim which is a half sibling of Amnon. What's so crazy about this passage is that Amnon is infatuated with his sister and he's like, I can't have her because she's my sister, but I am so infatuated with her that the Bible says he becomes sick in, with his infatuation for her. And then it says, Amnon had a friend who was crafty and his name was Jonadab, who happened to be one of his cousins. And he devises this plan. He says, if you really want your sister, why don't you pretend to be ill and have her sent to you to serve you some food and then you can do what you want with her. Well, Amnon being so filled with lust decides this is a good plan. So he lays down on his bed, he pretends to be sick and he requests from his father, King David, to have Tamar, his lovely sister, come and make him a beautiful dish and, and serve him and no one else, just Tamar. And so Tamar comes and she says, oh, I'm going to help my brother and I'm going to make him this dish. And she does. And she comes to serve him and he refuses to eat. And so he says, everyone out. And so he sends everyone out except for Tamar, because this is how lust works. It doesn't want to have people around. It doesn't want company unless you're helping somebody satisfy their lust. But lust, it likes to be in the dark. It likes to be in secret. It likes to be in isolation. That's where lust works. And so when everyone is sent out, it's just him and Tamar. Tamar comes to give him some food and he grabs her and says, lie with me, my beautiful sister. And she says, don't do this. You're going to be like one of the vain, foolish fellows. Don't do this. This is a horrible thing. This ought not to be done, as we all know. But Amnon was so filled with lust that it says he took her over and did what he will with her. This is a horrible, horrible scenario that happened because lust overpowered him to such an extent that he took it to the absolute extreme. Now, we have to beware of how lust comes and sneaks subtly into our lives. The irony about this whole incident with Amnon and Tamar and it being King David's son is that if you were to go just two chapters prior to this in chapter 11, this is where David himself falls to the horrible sin 
of lust with his affair with Bathsheba. Now Bathsheba was another man's wife. And King David, when he's supposed to be out at battle, as king should be, during the time when kings go out to war, he decided to stay at home. And as he's at home, he looks out on the rooftops and he sees a woman named Bathsheba who is bathing. And he says, who is this woman? Can you figure it out? And so he sends some people to go and they find out that this was Uriah the Hittite, one of David's men, and it was his wife. And so David says, I don't really care. Bring her to me. And so it says he sleeps with her. He has an affair with Bathsheba, another man's wife. To make a long story short, King David has Uriah assassinated because David ended up getting Bathsheba pregnant and he wanted to cover it up. And that's what happened. He tried to cover it up, but God sent a prophet named Nathan to expose David's lie and deceit and what he did. David repents. He did what a true man of God should do. He repents. He humbles himself before God. And he says, God, cleanse me of this evil. And now some of the Psalms that you read about where he talks about creating me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me, those were written according to what we know when he was in this place of repentance after having done such an evil thing and succumbing to lust. And so even if you fall into lust, if you fall into these sins, know that God can forgive you. God can cleanse you and he can help you to break free from lust so that you don't get overcome the next time. Now, many, many years later, when Jesus Christ is born and he comes into this world to save us sinners, what is interesting is as he's walking around and teaching, he says something so shocking. And this is what it says. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 18, Jesus says this, But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Now, this would come under the category of what we have nowadays, and that's pornography. Just looking at somebody with the intent to lust after them, he says, you've already done the act. That's what it is. In his eyes, you've done the act. Now, some people use this, say, well, I already did the act by looking, so I might as well just continue and do this whole thing. That's not what he's saying, but he's saying the extremity of such a thing as even looking at somebody with lustful intentions. If that's your intention to go after somebody, to lust after them, to undress them with your eyes, he says you've already committed adultery with those people in your heart. And so now we know it's a heart issue. It's an issue that goes beyond just, oh, I'm looking and that's it. No, it's a heart issue. There's something that needs to be changed in your heart. Your heart is not being pure before God. And so we have to say, God, cleanse me and do what David says. Say, God created me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me. The Apostle Paul gave Timothy some instructions concerning lust, and it's simply this, flee youthful lust. He didn't say fight it, he didn't say to combat it, though we do to some degree, but he says flee it. Don't try and spend too much time with lust because lust has this tendency and the ability to seduce people, to weave itself in and to tie its arms around you and to pull you into bondage. That is what lust does. And so the instructions that Paul gives is, is instructions of wisdom. He says, flee it, just run, just go, just get away from lust. There's other things you can fight and go to war with, but this thing, the way you war against lust is to flee from it. Don't put yourself in vulnerable situations and ways in which lust can wrap its tentacles around you. You've got to break free from lust by fleeing from it. Now, lust isn't always about sexual immorality, though that is probably the most common, but sometimes it's lust for things or somebody else's stuff or possessions or lust for more money or lust for this or lust for that. Always wanting something more, always wanting, I have to have it, and I, you become infatuated with it. That's the other thing. It's not just desiring something, but it's an infatuation, a strong desire that compels you to go out of your way to make sure it's done. A great example of this is found in the book of Numbers, chapter 11. It's where the children of Israel, they've been brought out of the land of Egypt and God has been providing for them supernaturally, bread from heaven or manna is what they call it. And they're eating this manna supernaturally. God is providing for them. He's taking care of their clothes and their shoes are not being worn out. All these awesome, miraculous things. But then they start complaining. They say, 
Oh, we remember the days of Egypt. Now, for those that don't know, Egypt often in the scriptures represents your past, it represents places of bondage where you used to be. But now you have this new reality. You're brought from Egypt. You're brought from your past. You're brought from your bondage into a new place. But the children of Israel, they say, we're not content with this supernatural provision, this man and all this stuff you're doing, God. We remember the good old days where we had leeks and we had onions and we had garlic and we had fish and we had all this endless supply of food. Yes, we were in bondage, but at least we could fulfill the lusts of our flesh. We had this lust problem. And so the interesting thing is, and I know it's cliche and people say it all the time, you can get the people out of Egypt, but you can't take Egypt out of the people. They still had a lust and a craving for things that they used to have. And this is how a lot of us are. Sometimes God takes us and he pulls us out of a past bondage. And then you get to a certain place in your walk with God where you're like, I remember the good old days. And when I used to live a certain way, according to the world, I didn't have all these issues and problems. And it seems like since I've come to God, all I have is issues. Well, the problem is you're not realizing that you entered into a a battle, when you decided to step towards the Lord Jesus Christ, you decided to enter into a battle. And the battle is not against flesh and blood, but it's against principalities. It's against spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. It's against all of this stuff that has to do with the spiritual realm. And so you've learned to move beyond that. And you can't let these things, the seductions of lust, pull you back into a place where you're saying, I want the things I used to have. When I was in the world, I had this. And when I was in the world, I had that. God said, come out from among them and be separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. And so lust tries to lure you back. That's another way how lust works. It tries to show you these beautiful, pearly, gold, shiny, shimmery, all these things that would, whatever it is that it fills your eyes. Remember, it's the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes. It's the eyes you, you see things or it's an advertisement. It's something constantly always showing you over and over and over and over and over and you see it and all of a sudden you lust for it and you want it so bad, but God's trying to pull you out and say, no, no more lust. You've got to have a hunger and thirst for righteousness and you shall be filled. This is what we need. And so we have to have everything transformed in our mind. The Bible says be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And so when our mind is renewed through the word of God and through prayer, then all of a sudden these lusts no longer pull us down. We can break free. Yes, they try to tempt us. They try and come. It's like the serpent. He slides sneakily and he's subtle. Or like Jonadab who says to Amnon, hey, I got an idea of the way you can fulfill your lust. Watch out for the serpent. Watch out for the Jonadabs in your life. Who's a Jonadab in your life? Who is the serpent in your life? Say, God, I want to know who are the Jonadab. Who are the serpents and get them out of my life because I don't want to deal with this lust. My prayer for you is this, that you wouldn't let lust bring you down, that you wouldn't let lust come into your life and, and just be the one who rules your life any longer. Because the reality is when you say Jesus is Lord, you declare that, you keep on declaring that. Say Jesus is Lord, Jesus is Lord, Jesus is Lord, because then it doesn't make room for any lust to be your Lord. The problem is often we submit to lust. We just say, I, I'm too weak. I can't do this. But the Bible lets me know that God won't put on you more than you can handle, more than you can bear. So any temptation that comes against you, know that God has confidence in you that you can overcome it. So anytime you fall into these things, it doesn't mean that you didn't have the strength to overcome them. It's that you yielded to the wrong things. You yielded to lust when God said, I'm going to give you something that you can overcome that. I've given you grace. I've given you my power. I've given you the Holy Spirit. I've given you something so that you can conquer these bondages and you can break free from lust. This can be the day that it's all over in your life. If you've been struggling with lust in any way, if you've been struggling, I pray in Jesus' name that that breaks off of you today, that that's no longer an issue, that those things that you thought you beat a long time ago and it keeps coming back and resurfacing, I pray that that is done now in the name of Jesus Christ. I pray that you're set free. God bless you. Be sure to like, be sure to subscribe, drop a comment and say, Set me free, Holy Spirit.